issues. Um, now, the next session, we're going to have it slightly differently. So, um, we're quite lucky in the Northeast. <laughs> they may well be lucky in other areas as well. Uh, we're lucky for a, a variety of reasons, but uh, particularly in thoracic uh, or chest wall analgesia anesthesia, I think we're pretty lucky. Um, at the RBI, for probably nearly how many? Six years? 40, uh, yeah. Like that, yeah. Um, uh, Varma's been uh, doing lots of ultrasound guided paravocal blocks, so we do it regularly for our breast lists. Um, and uh, since 20, well, maybe three or four years, we've been doing regularly ultrasound guided um, paravocal catheters for rib fractures. Uh, and I don't believe that many places are doing that regularly, certainly in major trauma centres. When I've looked down the, uh, at the major trauma centres, you can work out what people do um, by, for ver by various ways. And I don't think many, many places are. Maybe um, I think places like <coughs> they are doing epidurals and in London, I know that they're doing uh, serratus plane and these sorts of things. So I think in terms of paraverticals, we're slightly ahead of the curve there. Um, but also in the last probably year, probably it's about just over a year, um, one of the, I think, most promising uh, new blocks in chest wall was, was invented and described, which is the serratus plane, uh, the uh, erectus <laughs> spinae block, um, which is kind of the, let's say, maybe the third or fourth new novel uh, thoracic block in the last few years. So there's obviously been an interest in it. But in my opinion, it's probably the, the, it's the most um, promising of the lot. And uh, one of the first, some of the first people to write uh, about the clinical use of the lot sat there. So we've got not only some early adopters with ultrasound guided paraverticals, we've also got some early adopters with erectus spinae blocks. Um, so I'd like a, a show of hands. Ezra have supplied us with a voting app, but there's not that many of us, so we think we can get a few of with hands up. So obviously, uh, I want registrars to think about where you're working at the minute, and consultants where you obviously work all the time. In your hospital, for a rib fra fracture patient, can you put your hand up if you supply routinely regional anaesthesia for, the rib, fra for rib fractures? Okay, so I'm just working this out. So we've got five. Uh, we've got five. Some of that's biased because the most, a lot of those people are from the same hospital. So obviously Sunderland, Newcastle hospitals, um, Darlington, James Cook, he's just, start just started. Just yeah, because he's just moved there. <laughs> uh, so, so, not, so it's not ubiquitous, but, um, you know, but certainly a few places are doing it. Now, the more interesting question is, put your hands up if you put a paravertebral in for that. So, <laughs> so a reasonable number of people, and put your hands up if you put if you would put an erect spine in for that. Okay. More so often. maybe fifty-fifty, but some people have put their hands up twice, <laughs> which would is something that I guess we'll come on to. And the people who don't do it at all, who've got, who may not have a strong opinion about it. Um, what would you like to learn? Would you, do you think, wh where do you think the future is? Or do you have no idea? So, put your hand up if you think paravertebrals would be the thing that you'd look to try and do. Okay, so some people. Erectus spinae. Okay, about the same amount of people. Fine. And, finally. Epidural. No, or I was going to say none of them because you want to do something else. <laughs> or put your hand up if you think that Nerve blocks for rib fractures are a waste of time. Okay, there we go, perfect, good. No, right, <laughs> so, no, no, it's a question. Yeah. Is the problem is, where do, the, where do you keep the patients? Where do you keep the patients, indeed. So, let's, so this is fine. So, th That's there's fine. lots of things about introducing a service and these kinds of things that we can talk about. Um, but, for the next few minutes, we're going to have a, we're going to have both Varma and Duncan talk about their chosen block for today. So it's a slight, this is a slightly artificial separation, um, but Varma's going to give us 15 minutes on why paravertebrals are brilliant, 
and then Duncan's going to give us 15 minutes on why Eric's spinal blocks are brilliant, and then we're going to have a few minutes at the end to put that all together and uh, think about the future. And for the people that work somewhere where you don't yet do regular blocks for rib fractures, it might be helpful to think about how you'd introduce this sort of service. Good. So, this is Farmer. Uh, he works here and he does some paraverse work. Fine. Thank you. Right. I'll just go through what's the evidence about paravertebral block for thoracic analgesia. There are various options, as Jano has mentioned already, including novel blocks like serratus plane block and erectus spiny block. But the mainstay of therapy, along with the original block, is multimodal analgesia as well, which includes his oral paracetamol and NSAIDs. And then maybe there is some evidence about gabapentinoids to be used. So, uh, why choose paravertebral block? I will talk in, take into account the effectiveness, what the potential complication and failure rate, taking into account what's there available in literature as an evidence. Uh, just a brief overview of the spinal nerve as it comes out of the intervertebral foramen, basically it divides, immediately divides into posterior ramus and the anterior ramus. And what is noticeable is as it comes out of the intervertebral foramen, it loses the epineurium and partly the perineurium. That's why the effectiveness of the block is quite quick uh, because it has lo lost part of its membrane sheath as it exits the intervertebral foramen. The other thing to notice is the rami communicantes, they, from the ventral ramus, they communicate with the sympathetic ganglia. I will come to it why it is important uh, regarding paravertebral block. Brief overview of the intercostal nerve as it comes out of the intervertebral foramen, as I mentioned, uh, divides immediately into posterior and anterior ramus, and the anterior ramus or the ventral ramus goes, the travels between the internal intercostal muscle and the innermost intercostal muscle at, at the angle of rib, divides into the lateral cutaneous branch and continues in the front of the chest and gives the anterior cutaneous branch around besides the sternum. Coming to the paravertebral space anatomy, that's the wedge-shaped space. Uh, what's uh, over in the anterolateral part is the pleura and posteriorly is the transverse process and the internal coastal membrane which is the membranous part of the internal intercoastal muscle which amalgamates with the superior costal transverse ligament. And Basically, that is the posterior boundary of it, and medial boundary is the vertebra and the vertebral bo body and the intervertebral disc. So, that's the longitudinal view of the paravertebral space. As you could see, the paravertebral space is connected through the in, up and down, and studies have shown if you inject about 15 ml of local anesthetic at a particular level, there is the the local anesthesia travels more corded than cephalad, about 5 to 8 segments somatic and about 8 to 10 sympathetic. Uh, so, the roughly the guidance about putting local anesthetic is about 10 ml for 5 segments for somatic block and uh, the infusion which has been recommended, there is varied infusion rate which has been recommended in literature, but Katz and Artal recommend is ropivacaine. 0.3 percent, taking into account it does not have the linear accumulation as levo BP vacan and BP vacan has got at 0.1 mL per kg per hour. So, how does the local anesthetic spread when you inject into the paravertebral spread uh, space? Basically, it blocks the anterior um, posterior ramus and the anterior ramus, it does block the sympathetic ganglia, which is around the anterolateral part of the vertebral body, but there is some spillage into the epidural space and intercostal space and around in front of the vertebral body to the other side. That's the scan finding uh, by injecting the contrast they found there what I mentioned is there is spillage into the epidural space and uh, in front of the vertebral body. There is some literature evidence to suggest when they injected contrast and found out the effectiveness of paravertebral block, if you get a longitudinal spread, 
that is much more effective than if you have a cloud-like appearance or when you are injecting the local anesthetic under ultrasound guidance, if you are getting too much of lateral spread, you are not in the right space. Bear in mind the, trans the nerves are coming out behind the transverse process. So you should get rather is a more waterfall type of effect under ultrasound guidance. There should not be too much of lateral spread. The theory behind it is there is some evidence that there is an endothoracic fascia which divides the paravertebral space into anterior and posterior space. If you are posterior to the endothoracic fascia, you will get more lateral spread rather than the waterfall effect. So if you get more lateral spread, you might have to move the needle few millimeters scaffold so that you don't get much lateral spread. At our institution, we generally do is the transverse technique. The we do count the ribs initially to determine which level we have to do and then we turn the probe longitudinally to identify the transverse process and move, move gently laterally till we identify is the transverse process. If you can't identify the transverse process, better to move, slide your probe over the rib and the rib is the landmark because it joins with the transverse process. So if you see this dark, some hyperechoic line with the dark shadow behind the hump like that's the transverse process you will see when you slide your probe into the intercostal space is the pleura and if you just angulate the probe a bit long obliquely most of the time you will be able to see is this wrongly labeled it should be the superior costal transverse ligament along with the intercostal membrane and the idea is to deposit is the local anesthetic into this wedge shaped space just a bit of facts about this is Benjamin et al. They analyzed the National Trauma Data, data Bank, which had about 700,000 patients with blunt thoracic trauma. Out of that, 60,000 had rib fracture. And their analysis basically suggests is as the number of rib fracture increases, mortality increases up to 35% with more than eight rib fracture. The patients who had intervention with epidural in the analysis, the more survival was significantly improved from 65% to al almost 98%. What is the effectiveness of paravertebral block for thoracic analgesia? Various studies have been done. And one, at least most of the study found that the paravertebral is as a minimum as effective as thoracic epidural, but unlike epidural, paravertebral can be applied unilaterally, so you get less hemodynamic instability. And Naja et al. in their study found for thoracotomy patient, there was reduced length of stay in patients who had paravertebral block. There are various other meta-analyses and systematic review. They all suggest is paravertebral to be as equivalent as thoracic epidural. Bear in mind, all of these studies are for the landmark technique. There was a study done by Marat et al. where, where they compared is the paravertebral block uh, with versus PCA morphine and they found there was significantly reduced VAS score in patients who had thoracic paravertebral. But the cumulative uh, dose of morphine required in this patient was not significantly different they basically came to the conclusion immediate morphine reduction was there in recovery, but most probably there was not much difference in the cumulative morphine requirement was because they were on other multimodal analgesia along with the um, technique of either PCA or paravertebral including Keterolac. Prevention of pulmonary complication, again the various studies have been done including prospective study by Richardson et al and they found is basically paravertebral improves the pulmonary function, but the Cochrane review done for the thoracotomy patient by Young et al. suggests that there is not much significant difference in pulmonary complication for patients undergoing thoracotomy. This is the study done by Karmakar et al. Where is it, is it not? Okay. Karmakar et al. in 15 consecutive patients uh, who had rib fracture in their study 
they found that the VAS score was significantly reduced in patients who had paravertebral block and the respiratory pulmonary function test was also significantly in improved including the oxygenation index and the saturation. This dilemma, paravertebral space is a quite highly vascular space, so it, there might be incidence of hematoma or vascular puncture. So vascular puncture incidence with the landmark technique has been shown to be around 4% with hematoma developing in about 2% of patients. But the Richardson et al, they did a meta-analysis and systematic review of bilateral thoracic paravertebral block and they found that it was not much significant increase in the incidence of hematoma or vascular puncture even though you perform bilateral paravertebral block and there was not much significant <coughs> difference in hemodynamic stability even though you perform bilateral paravertebral block. This is a recent study done in cardiovascular thoracic patient basically by Okitsu and Katayama in patients who had coagulation abnormality or they were on anticoagulant and they didn't had any much significant difference. They didn't get any hematoma in their study. This was, this study was done in about 140 patients and this study was done in about 35 patients. Chronic pain syndrome, there is much, there is enough evidence in literature if you do some regional analgesia intervention for breast surgery or chest trauma patient, the incidence of chronic pain is significantly reduced. This surprising thing is the incidence of chronic pain. We did in our hospital as a snapshot audit, incidence quite high, 60 to 90 percent. So it is recommended if you do some sort of regional analgesia, it is effective. Why paravertebral block? This study done by Richardson et al, where they basically measured the somatosensory evoked potential at the level of block and uh, two to three segments above and below. And they found at the level of block, the cortical response was totally abolished up to three segments, cephalad and corded, and it was depressed um, up to eight segments cranially and caudally, which suggests basically that if we do the paravertebral, because paravertebral blocks is the sympathetic ganglion and chain, which hasn't been found in any other study where you do central neuroaxial block, because the ganglion are anterolateral to the vertebral body, and there is more spread of local acidic rostrally to the sympathetic ganglion compared to the central neuroaxial block. And this study done by Covini et al. in breast surgery, about 150 patients, they achieved surgical anesthesia in 85% patient with paravertebral block and 90% of patients with paravertebral and anesthet local anesthetic supplement by the surgeons. Complication and side effects, various reviews have been done including meta-analysis and it has been found that Definitely, there is significantly less incidence of side effects compared to the central neuroaxial block. And this study done by Davis et al., where they compared the incidence of side effects and complication, and the paravertebral group had a less complication compared to the epidural group. This is just a, as mentioned before, Richardson et al., they did the meta-analysis and systematic review. As you could see, we, even with bilateral block, the incidence of complications are not much different compared to the unilateral paravertebral block. There was no evidence of local anesthetic systemic toxicity in their study, nor any neurological sequelae. Failed block, it is quite varied. It depends basically on the expertise of the operator and, more the, and the, in case there is accidental dislodgement, that also results in failed block. The incidence quoted in literature is about 6 to 10 percent for paravertebral block. This is the study which I would like to highlight is about in 1,400 patients undergoing ultrasound guided thoracic paravertebral block and they analyzed the side effects and complication. Only six patients had complication, majority were symptomatic bradycardia and hypotension in vasovagal episode. Two patients, there was possible 
local anesthetic toxicity and there was no evidence of spread of paravertebral injection into the central canal and they recommend that single injection transverse in plane ultrasound guided paravertebral block is safe for patient undergoing mastectomy. So in summary, paravertebral has got an advantage that you can do is an unilateral block and patient has got relative hemodynamic stability with low incidence of complication. The important aspect compared to epidural is early mobilization and our, even upper GI surgery, sophagectomy and all, now compared to two years back, 80% of patients are not getting thoracic epidural, they are getting is paravertebral block along with uh, rectus sheath block and PCA fentanyl and spinal dimorphin and the basically audit done by our acute pain team has suggested patients mobilize earlier because they are not getting hypotension, they are not sedated well, and they are much more better than if patients who have got thoracic epidural, thoracic epidural the disadvantage has been because of motor weakness there was problem with mobilization and for hemodynamic instability especially with this major surgery. Our service, I will skip most of the slides here. We use curl catheter for paravertebral. We, you know, kindly an analyze the TARN database and our regional anesthesia database as well. And we have done is about 244 paravertebral block for refractures. May, uh, 300 now, as John is saying. What I want to highlight is here, page, the TARN database basically gives a predictable survival rate for each individual unit, taking into account the patients are admitted in each unit. And in our unit, patients who didn't get the block, there was 15% mortality compared to 2% in paravertebral group, and the extra survivors were three times more in paravertebral group. Well, people might come to the inference that it is just because we are doing is paravertebral block in less sicker patient. So the analysis was done, taking into account is there is more than 80% survival and still the mortality was significantly less in paravertebral group compared to the um, uh, patients who didn't get the paravertebral and the extra survival per 100 patients was again four times more compared to patients who didn't get paravertebral. I'll skip that slide. In conclusion, even though thoracic epidural is still a gold standard, paravertebral has the advantage of anesthetizing specific dermatome while sparing inferior region where we would not like the block to spread and large systematic review and meta-analysis has supported it and at least paravertebral is not inferior to thoracic epidural and it seems to fare better compared to thoracic epidural taking into account the side effect profile. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for giving us the opportunity to come here today and, and tell you about the erector spinae plane block. Um, and um, as, um, where do I point this to when I want to change it just anywhere? It's not doing it. So, um, I just introduced Duncan because I didn't introduce him. Uh, so, Duncan's a consultant who um, has worked. He's worked in quite a lot of different places. So he's worked in the States, but before before that and since that in in Darlington, which is where a lot of the erect spinae plane block um, was happening, and he's yeah. also um, been involved with. Durham Medical School, uh, which is now defunct, well not defunct, but it is basically defunct, isn't it? it yeah. Uh, so, uh, because that happened, Duncan decided to move to James Cook for a bit of a new challenge, which is obviously mm. a major trauma centre, but that doesn't have a strong history of regional anaesthesia. There you go. Thank you very much. So, um, the, our involvement with this block stems from this paper. Uh, Jonathan said that it was um, just over a year ago. It, it was... Um, it was the middle of, um, it was August, September 2016 and um, actually Basker um, showed me this paper in theatre one day and I just said let's do it and, uh, and the next day we had a patient with multiple rib fractures. It had never, it, it, in this paper 
they described a novel thoracic fascial plane block um, which was used in a series of uh, cases of patients with uh, neuropathic thoracic pain and also um, post thoracotomy pain. So we had a patient, we, we thought this would be good for rib fractures and we had a patient the very next day uh, with multiple rib fractures and um, Varma's um, uh, um, had this picture up already so um, th this is from that paper and so I, I'm not going to go over that again now because uh, it was just to, to outline the, the important anatomy. We've, we've had that. So, so we did it in a patient and we had very good results. Um, we found it easy to do and so we, we decided to report that. Um, and th this is from that article and it shows um, the key anatomy related to, uh, um, to, to the erector spinae block. So these are ultrasound images um, and um, these are the transverse processes and this is the erector spinae muscle here and it just sits on top of the um, transverse processes and um, the needle is directed um, towards the transverse process and you inject local into this fascial plane and the fascial plane opens up and the end point for a successful injection is when you see um, local anaesthetic spreading um, craniad and cordad following injection. Now, uh, we use saline to open up that space now and then we put a catheter in and, and put local anaesthetic uh, through the catheter. So, um, this picture is the, sa the same ultrasound images but in the centre you can see uh, the position of the probe, uh, the position of the needle, the patient's just sitting up low down so that because you're quite high up, um, depending on the level you're going at, this was at about, I think this was T5, this one, well it says yeah T5, T4, um, so uh, it, it's ergonomically easier just to do it sitting up there. Um, and, um, and then subsequently we, we, we've done many now, we've done well over 50, um, but um, this was the first one with, um, with bilateral um, rib fractures that, that we reported. Um, now it was interesting hearing Varma talking about paravertebral blocks and I noticed there were some, some quite old papers there um, from 20 years ago and, and Johnny Richardson actually taught me to do paravertebral blocks when I was a trainee. So um, I, I, um, I, I came, kind of grew up learning paravertebral blocks um, but um, very much changed, changed to this now. Um, this is just another picture. Um, showing um, the, the needle trajectory for, for a block. Um, and Leone is in the audience today as well, just by coincidence, so it's very nice to see her here, because she helped um, Basker and myself with this, with this poster. And when we'd done uh, 10, which is quite a long time ago now, um, we, we submitted this poster just to, uh, to show um, that um, it seemed to be very successful in reducing pain scores in patients with multiple rib fractures. Um, and uh, there's a, the, the thing here is just that, that graph that shows that um, following erector spinae plane block, um, there's a decent improvement in pain scores. Now, um, when, when um, Ferrero et al. described the erector spinae plane block, which is a thoracic fascial plane block, as we've said. Um, they, uh, the, the first time they did it, they put the needle superficial to the erector spinae muscle, and then subsequently they put it deep to the erector spinae um, muscle. And um, we were trying to determine um, what the mechanism of action for the erector spinae plane block was. And um, we speculated that at that time that you know, it was a plane block, and um, we got this idea that it could be a sheath block, and I, I think we've pretty much discounted this now, but I, um, I, I'm just mentioning it because we, 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 um, we thought it was important to get into the erector spinae muscle sheath, but um, um, what this is, is uh, just, a, just a loop of an um, erector spinae plane block in a cadaver, and it's just to show you the, the opening up that you can see um, dynamically up and down. As you scan up and down, you can see that space um, opening up here. 
Um, and um, you can see the needle in there just at a different level. So this is at two levels just, just um, joined together. Um, it's really important to see that because that's the picture you're looking for. You want to see that, that space opening up when you do the block. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we do the, um, when we do the workshops. Um, but this is some of our own cadaver work. Um, and this was a dye study which just shows a few different levels of dissection. And you can see um, dye, we all, we all know dye goes everywhere, but um, uh, I find it really hard to see at that angle there. But um, the erector spiny muscles um, are um, here. And um, as we go deeper, uh, you can see that um, the, um, the pattern of spread of the dye fits quite closely and with what you see on CT studies. And we've done our own CT studies, um, but I can't show you any data from that today, unfortunately. Um, and uh, this was a different cadaver where you could see that there's a lot of lateral spread as well, um, which was interesting. Um, now, before I talk about, um, uh, well, I'm going to talk about uh, quite a few general uh, points about the erector spinal plane block. I just want to mention this um, variation, which is a, a hybrid block between the erector spinal plane block and between a paravertebral block that was reported. And this, uh, what they do is uh, the, the, the midpoint is midway between uh, the transverse process, which is just about where we would um, put the needle for an erector spinal block and the superior costa transverse ligament where the paravertebral block goes. And um, uh, this is a video from their paper. Uh, in fact, I, I'm just going to skip to the second video um, uh, because there, there's two similar ones. But this one is very interesting to me because what you see is this is the, this is the midpoint here. But as they inject, actually you get local anaesthetic spreading um, into the erector spinae plane. Let me just... Actually, this is the one that it spreads better in. Um, how do I press play? I've done it, yeah. So, so there's the needle, they're bouncing it. And then look at this, it comes over the top and you can see the erector spinae plane opening up there. So, so really, it's, to me, that's, um, that's local anaesthetic spreading into the erector spinae plane. Uh, do you want to see that again? Pardon? Yeah, yeah, um, that, that, that's correct. So, so, um, so one of the reasons I'm showing you this is that, uh, first of all, a lot of those studies that, that Varma presented um, were based on blind paravertebral blocks. All, all of John Richardson's work was done without ultrasound. And when we first saw the erector spinae plane block, um, we discussed it and we thought, is the erector spinae plane block a paravertebral block by proxy? Um, is, is the local anaesthetic, is the mechanism that the local anaesthetic is actually tracking into the paravertebral space? And that's what our current research is trying to elucidate. Um, and um, um, that would explain, uh, what I should say also is that although there's a huge evidence base for, for paravertebral blocks, there's very little research in erector spinae plane blocks. Um, typically, in regional anaesthesia, when a new technique comes out, um, there's a kind of mushroom effect or uh, almost an exponential, exponential increase in the amount of work that comes out. People in regional anaesthesia in our specialty adopt changes very quickly and learn new techniques and um, pass them on. And I think over the next couple of years we will start to see randomised control trials and higher levels of evidence. But all we've got at the moment is case studies and case reports. Um, so we don't have the level of evidence. Um, but uh, I, I think it will come. Um, and um, um, what, what I can tell you about the erector spinae plane block um, to, to favour it for, um, for the treatment of pain associated with multiple rib fractures uh, over paravertebral as the first choice is that, first of all, it requires less technical expertise to perform. Um, 
it's, uh, it's easy to teach, it's easy to learn. You're not putting a needle near the pleura, so um, you're not putting it near any big vessels. Um, you're not going to get a pneumothorax unless you're way off target. Um, you don't, uh, you're not going to get epidural spread. The patients do not need to go to a high dependency area for monitoring. There's no levels to be checking. Um, they can mobilise and many of our patients have walked around the ward with unilateral or bilateral er erectospinal catheters in place. And um, um, so the, the, the nurse monitoring intensity is low. Um, they can cough and give their own physiotherapy by walking around. If patient, in, in, uh, in modern medicine now, it seems like every other patient is anticoagulated with some drug or other, warfarin, um, rivaroxaban, you know, it goes on forever. And um, this can be a problem with patients who present, who uh, you, you, you'd think twice about doing a paravertebral block or an epidural in these patients. But you, you don't need to think twice. Um, although we don't have any evidence, we've done it. And um, um, uh, you don't need to worry in the same way that you would because you're just giving an intramuscular injection. In, in essence, you, the, the injection is not going intramuscularly, but your needle's going through a muscle to a fascial plane. So, so in that regard, uh, we expect to be able to prove in the future that, that um, it's, it's very safe. Um, a lot of the evidence that um, we saw for the paravertebral block was related to thoracic surgery where, where the incision's in a single dermatome um, and um, we, we, we're looking main, mainly at, at rib fractures where multiple levels are involved and um, although you pointed out that a, you can give a single injection um, uh, and get multiple levels, we're using catheter techniques um, where, where we get multiple levels and a lot of that a, a lot of the stuff that John Richardson did was he actually used to do multiple level injections um, so we're doing a single injection we're putting a catheter in the catheter is the key to success because it gives you know you can keep it in for days and um, I think this probably answers part of your um, question earlier on about where do we look after these patients on the ward is the answer um, so um, I, I, that's really the main things I wanted to say and, and, and then I really wanted to open the floor up for discussion and um, uh, you know sort of try and have a balanced argument with my, my colleague um, so uh, fire away. Yeah, in the, for this to clarify yes it's just for to generate interest into the discussion all our patients with thoracic epidural unless and until they have got systemic problem they go to the ward. They do not also need any special monitoring. They are in the ward, looked after by the general ward nurses. They do not need it. Some of the hospitals so have got is the paravertebral going. We haven't had any single incidence of local toxicity or motor uh, blockage or anything related to paravertebral either. So do the nurses not monitor them to see if they've got a motor block? They do monitor is yeah. a PCA chart or epidural yeah. chart. We have got a nerve catheter chart. So, that so is the right, because they don't need even that for with an erectus spiny plane block. So, so um, we will not monitor any motor block, nerve catheter, motor block, or analgesia. They don't get a motor block. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, great question. Uh, so, so the, the key to success with the erector spinal plane block is it's a volume block. It's a, it's a, it's a fascial plane block. So um, the initial bolus um, is, is a decent bolus. It's 20 to 30 mils. Um, and um, um, it, it's, um, it's highly beneficial to... What, what happens is that when we first started doing it, the, the issue we had was we, we put the block in and the patient would literally go, oh, that's amazing, you know, they, they hadn't been able to move for, for two days or whatever, and they, they'd literally get off the, off the trolley and get back onto their own bed themselves. But then later on, or, or we'd go back the next day and, and we'd find that somebody started a PCA morphine in the night and, and they were obtunded again. And um, what we realised is that an infusion, an infusion is, is not always adequate on its own. You need to programme in boluses. So they need boluses to... So, all you need to do is, if they do get 
short-term breakthrough pain is give them a rescue bolus and they're back to, back to stage one. Um, but, um, you know, um, I, I, I um, programmed a 12-hourly um, bolus into my, uh, into my um, block last week that I did and um, the patient had zero pain from a few minutes after the block was put in um, until it came out a week later, well, five, six days later. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it, there's no um, didactic answer to that question, but we've kept them in for a week, um, but we've kept them in for, on average, um, f five or six days for people with severe chest wall injuries. Um, the, the pain nurses inspect the catheters every day. Uh, we have a look at them if we're doing a, a, an acute pain round. Um, and um, so, um, and they're, they're pretty stable. I, I, I don't think we've had any fallout, have we? I, I'm not... We tunnel them, yeah, so absolutely we do, yeah, but I, I'm not aware of any that have come up. So we, we, we do a lot of nerve catheters generally at the RBI and, um, you know, paravirtuals, what we've done a handful of rectifiers. Do we do catheters like this? Yeah, yeah, so we do yeah. catheters, well, yeah, catheters, catheters yeah. as well for refresh, yeah. So, um, uh, and essentially all the catheters, we've got rid of the whole, you know, five days take it out, which you would do for an epidural of seven, you know, five, basically five, five days. We run them indefinitely with pain nurse review every day. In, in Barbara do we do like a bolus as like an... Yeah, so we do yeah. pretty... Uh, uh, initial initial bolus. Bolus. Oh, so we do an initial bolus and an infusion, and we prescribe breakthrough uh, boluses so that the pain nurses can give them. Sometimes they need them, sometimes they do. But no, in, in some of we do the same, we, I mean, we don't take them out as mm. a set amount of time because it's, it's an issue of benefit versus risk. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. So you don't want to take something out that's giving someone yeah. you know, good analgesia but providing and, and looking at it, it doesn't look infected. Um, but I mean, just talking about risk, you, a lot of the patients we put either paravertical or ESP in, they're, they're patients who are really not doing very well. They're the COPD mm. that, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. that, that mm. we don't give them good analgesia they'll end up on HPU or, or they'll die. So um, the, the, rea yeah, the reality of, of, of this regional anaesthetic technique is that even with a doctor sound guided paravertebral, you're looking at a risk of serious complication, which is less than one in one and a half thousand or something like that. These patients have a, you know, we, we, we said that the non, the non at risk group there were the ones that had more than 20% mortality. Hip fracture, if you have a hip fracture in the UK, now, your, your mortality nationally is around about 6%. So rib fractures, it's worse to have rib yeah. fractures than it is to have, um, than it is to have uh, a hip fracture. And the, this is my point, is, is that if you're going to make a choice about a patient who has a significant mortality, then do you choose a paravertebral that has a huge evidence base behind it, or do you choose an ESP? Well, there's, 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 there's not a good evidence. Yes, there. that's what I, we were discussing, mm. basically. What do I do? I can do a paravertebral, and this patient definitely needs some sort of analgesia, and I know that paravertebral does work. <coughs> Should I be doing electrospinal? We, at least we agreed that if, if it is feasible, we should go with the evidence paravertebral works, and we have got study done in our unit as well, and we have found it to be effective, so I will do personally this part, I want to know. Our, our practice is, is similar, but, but we've had two, two where we've put, yes, I think two <coughs> catheters in um, recently. One had um, a loss of had, um, surgical emphysema because of a pneumothorax over the chest wall, and paravertical scanning was really difficult. Um, the other one was anticoagulated, um, and just uh, on a clinical basis, I brought the, you know, the, the evidence it just seems to favor ESP block in those specific scenarios. But I think it's quite difficult to move away from a block with a big evidence base to a block with a smaller evidence base. I think it's difficult to move away from a block that you'd, you've been doing for years as well. Uh, I think it's difficult, you know, it's difficult to make that leap because when you've got a, something that works really well and you guys have perfected it. Um, I Yeah. Uh, but we have had very 
good successes, but bad failures as well with paravertical. So I'm not denying that. The problem with paravertical is it, it is a great block as a single injection block. The moment you add catheter into the paravertical block, there is clear evidence, obviously he has not shown in the slides, that 25 to, because the, that presentation is, is in my uh, talk, 25 to 40% clear evidence included from all of Austria, every single group, 25 to 40% of the time the paravertical catheter is either in the epidural space or in the pleura or in the pole or in subcutaneous lymphoma. It is not clearly working, it works. It is not clearly working by paravertical block. It works by different mechanisms. And there is clear evidence, I can quote at least six to seven papers, including a MRI study. So the paravertical block as a single injection block is good. If we can visualize it, I would recommend it, go for it. But a lot of the times we have patients where it is difficult to visualize. You're so close to the pleura. Second thing is a lot of patients with rib fractures get a lot of hemothorax and pleural effusion already. So you won't see the pleura like you are approximated. The pleura will be floating away somewhere. There will be a lot of fluid between them. You don't know whether you actually are putting it into the paravertical space or something else because it, the anatomy is so different from seeing it in a, in a normal person when I scan and we scan in this afternoon. It really actually introduces lots of things into the chest because you've got a lung